afternoon, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Erin Strain. I am the chair of the Live Better Committee with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, as a member of the Live Better Committee, I want to let you guys know that it is our main purpose to create and maintain a culture of health and wellness among businesses um, in the community and St. Tammany Parish residents um, through education in the employer space um, on the importance of health and wellness. Um, Today, we have a great presentation for you guys on recognizing changes in behavior um, as it relates to addiction and suicide. We have some great presenters. Um, before I jump into who those presenters are, a couple of housekeeping things. So you guys will all remain muted. Um, we do want you to feel comfortable asking questions. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a question, dropping those in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, we're not using the chat feature, we're using Q&A. Um, this is also being recorded, so if you feel like this information was valuable, which I know you will, um, and you want to pass this recording along to, um, to someone else in the community, we'd love to have you do that. We will be sending out the recording as well as the slides this afternoon. So without further ado, I want to introduce a couple of our speakers. So we have three speakers today. Um, I have a little short bio on each speaker. Um, we have Ms. Mary Burkell. She is the Safe Haven Director and has worked on the Safe Haven Project. This is a parish-owned continuum of care with behavioral health campuses um, since 2018. Parish President Cooper appointed Mary the Director of Health and Human Services, and she has a passion to improve behavioral health treatment and hopes to lead the Safe Haven Campus into a new phase while staying true to Safe Haven's vision. Monique Gregoire has been with NAMI St. Tammany since 2017. She serves as the outreach specialist, promoting mental health and awareness throughout, throughout the community. She's graduated from Southeastern Louisiana University with a BA in mass communications and has over 15 years of experience in both corporate and nonprofit settings. Um, and then we also have with us Mr. Nick Rishar, and he has served as the executive director of NAMI St. Tammany since December of 2008. Um, during his tenure, he's built a very strong community relationships with law enforcement, mental health care providers, and community leaders. Um, we all hope that you guys really resonate with what we have here today and understand that mental health is not something that we shouldn't talk about. It's definitely something that if you see someone struggling, we're going to give you some resources today. So we want you guys um, to have those resources. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Monique Gregoire and I am the Outreach Specialist with Donnie St. Tammany. So thank you so much, Chamber, for having us here today to talk about mental health. You know, it's one of the most important things we can do is open up the conversation about mental health so that, you know, it decreases that stigma and it lets people know that it's okay when you're having issues. Just to give you an idea of kind of where we stand, since August 1st of this year, Louisiana has ranked in first and second consistently for people that are dealing with anxiety and depressive issues. That it ranges anywhere, you know, every week ranges between 39% and 44%. And it's no wonder. Look at everything we've dealt with over the last almost two years at this point. Um, from Hurricane Ida, most recent, to the COVID shutdown and financial struggles, people losing houses, jobs, and everything in between. So we are struggling as a community and what's going to make the difference is, you know, us coming together, talking about it, reaching out a helping hand to our neighbor, just like we did right after Hurricane Ida, and making that difference. So to give you an idea of kind of where we started from, pre-COVID, we had one in five individuals who experienced the mental health condition every year. With everything that we've gone through, the uncertainty, the job loss, the stress, that returning to work, returning to work was a huge thing for a lot of people. We currently have one in three individuals experiencing that anxiety and depression. And you can see from the, from the little chart below that this happened very early on. So we shut down right around March. In June of last year, people were already starting to have that anxiety and depression symptoms showing up, whether they had experienced it before and those symptoms were increasing or whether they were experiencing it for the first time. Something else that started happening, people started or increased substance abuse. 
I can tell uh, substance use. I can tell you I'm not a big drinker. Um, but when I found out we were shutting down, I was like, okay, let me go get a few bottles of wine just to keep in the house. And a lot of people kind of did the same thing. Now you're stuck in the house and you're bored. Suicide. About 11% of people seriously considered suicide. They were dealing with, you know, the mundane, the day in, day out, not knowing when it was going to end. And to think that, you know, 11% of people did not have hope. They felt like there was no other option. That's a scary place to be. This chart over on the left kind of says the same thing, but it gives you an idea of the difference. So the first graph shows January to June of 2019. This is people that are reporting symptoms of anxiety and depression, but that's over a six month period. If you look at January of this year, that's one month shows a 41%. 41% of people, so nearly half of individuals are dealing with some type of issues. The other chart, the other chart talks a little bit more about substance abuse. Um, so you can see the three highest ranks. Why did people start using it more? Out of boredom, out of anxiety, and because you stockpiled, just like we as individuals were stockpiling, you know, toilet paper and Lysol wipes, people that use recreational drugs or maybe cover it, you know, deal, to deal with their day-to-day, -day, we're drinking more and more. We're stuck in the house. They were locked down. They were anxious about going out into the world. They were dealing with depression. So of course they're going to start using, they have this stockpile of alcohol and drugs and they're going to start using more and more, which is going to lead to more overdoses. It's also going to, you know, increase that depression as well. Now, mental health at work. We spend a third of our lives at work. You know, the people that we work with day to day, that's that's like our extended family. I guarantee you, Nick knows, you know, what my kids do, football and everything else, because we are our own little entity and we support each other. But your mental health can really make a strain in your work. Depression causes, you know, 200 million lost work days a year. Over the last almost two years, there's been nearly half of U.S. employees report a decline in mental health. I guarantee you after the hurricane, you know, we're three weeks back from the hurricane and all of us around the office were like, oh, we're tired. And, you know, we're, we're all drained. We're not at 100% because we're dealing with things of our personal lives. We're trying, we're all craving that sense of normalcy. Um, again, the little graph shows almost 46% of people showed a decline in work. You know, 20% stayed about the same. 31% says it improved, but you know, maybe that's the, the, the person that lives by themselves and they're like, oh, I like working at home. I like sleeping in late, else. but it can put a strain and we're here to support each other. So mental health and substance abuse can cost U.S. employers between 79 and $105 billion a year. You know, that comes from not wanting to get up, miss work days, lack of productivity, mistakes. You know, if you're not performing at your best, then you're there's going to be mistakes that are made. And a lot of times we always talk about stigma. Stigma is probably the number one reason don't get, people don't get help. Of, of the people that have a mental health condition, only 45% of people get help every single year. So it takes 11 years from the onset of mental health sim symptoms until actually getting treatment. There's no other diagnosis where you're going to wait 11 years. And it's because a lot of times people are afraid. They're afraid that it's going to show some time, some type of weakness. Um, they feel like, you know, I should be able to do this on our own. But there's other things that contribute to it as well. You know, a lot of people can't afford it. If you think about it, you know, going to see a therapist might cost between $100 and $150 per session. That adds up. And some people have to choose between, okay, can I make groceries? Can I make rent this month? Or do I go take care of my mental health? Um, a lot of people feel like they can handle the problem on their own or they don't know where to go. You know, the mental health system is very difficult to navigate and especially if you don't know where you're going or what to do. You know, a lot of times people will give up. But again, we're here talking about mental health because it's going to open that door. It's going to let people know that it's absolutely okay. So what can employers do? The biggest thing, like we've said before, 
talking about mental health, whether you're putting it in your newsletter, newsletters, um, e-blast, providing resources in the break room, just having that available so that it becomes a topic of conversation. It's okay for me, you know, to go go to my coworkers, even my boss, and just say, look, I'm I'm just not in it today. You know, all this stuff is going on and I just can't. It's okay to do that. Offering PTO or mental health days can make a difference. Um, mental health first aid trainings to let your employees know how to take care of one another and offering an employee benefits. A lot of times, while you might be providing medical benefits, they might not include behavioral health. And again, they're back to square one. They're like, okay, well, I can't afford that. So I'm just not going to do it. Um, including it in wellness campaigns. I can't tell you how many organizations have reached out just over the last six months and said, hey, can you come and just talk to our organizations about mental health and what we can do to help each other? being there to support one another. <clears throat> so some of the benefits, increased productivity, um, completion, higher quality work, employee engagement. One of the biggest things is loyalty. You know, we always talk about if you take care of your employees, they're going to take care of your organization. And I know that's definitely true here. Letting them know that it's okay to be human and it's okay to have struggles and, you know, that's what we're here for will increase, you know, what you're getting out of your workers. So some of the things about recognizing mental health symptoms, we work with the same people day in, day out. Um, we know their tendencies, but when you're seeing it for prolonged periods, you're going to notice those changes in personalities. You're going to notice whether they're, you know, withdrawing, whether they want to kind of lock themselves in their office, feeling overwhelmed. <clears throat> they're showing up to, to work late. They're making more, more issues, mistakes, um, just complete changes. We can recognize that in people that we're with every single day. And it's okay to reach out. Talking about it does not make it any, does not make it worse. Starting a conversation is one of the best things you can do. Letting your coworker know, hey, you know, are you doing okay? You just seem like you're not yourself. Is something going on? It does one of two things. Number one, it lets them know, hey, someone, someone cares about me. And if I'm ready to talk about it, I can talk about it. But number two, if they're not ready to talk about it, they know that they can come back to you later on if they feel like talking to someone. But it also kind of flags them and says, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not handling this as well as I think I am. Maybe, you know, people are starting to notice and they're asking me what's going on, then maybe I do need to get some help. Listening without judgment is extremely important. You don't want to minimize anyone's feelings. If someone is going through something, chances are they're going to feel alone in that. They're going to feel like I'm the only person that is experiencing this right here. No one else knows what I'm going through. You know, telling someone, oh, you, you'll get through it, it's fine. That's minimizing and it's making them feel more isolated and more alone. Or encouraging professional help. If you see that they need it, hey, let me help you find someone. A lot of times when someone is trying to get help, they're going to make the first phone call and they might be told, hey, we don't take your insurance. They'll make the second call and they might have a six-week lead time. By the third call, if they're not taking new patients, then that person's ready to give up. So being that extra step and reaching out and saying, let me help you find someone, you know, we have the same insurance, that can make all the difference for someone. And if you don't know what to do next, give us a call. That's what we're here for. The whole reason that we exist is to help provide that guidance, that support, and those resources. So we're going to get you through that next step. Maintaining wellness. Um, just like, you know, mental Mental and physical wellness go hand in hand. You have to make sure that, you know, you're working towards a healthy diet. I'm not saying you don't have to, you know, you have to skip the cake, but have a balance and try to, try to increase your water intake, try to increase those things to have that overall healthy diet. Exercise. It is beautiful outside. Even if you just go sit outside with your laptop and work for a little while, um, get outside, walk for five minutes. That can help alleviate some of the stress that you're going through. If you see your coworkers going through it, hey, let's take our break together, make a little lap around the parking lot. That helps. 
and I always feel a little hypocritical when it comes to sleep. Um, I'm a mom with two kids, so seven to eight hours sleep is like a luxury to me. But if you're not getting it, let's say you go to bed at, you know, 10 30, 11 30 one night, and you're like, you know, I really, I got to get up early in the morning. It's okay if we make mistakes as long as we're working towards it. If we say, okay, we're going to bed late, but I'm going to go ahead and work towards, you know, going to bed a little bit earlier. So as long as we're working towards this, we're working toward that overall mental and physical wellness that balance each other. And like I say, fun is more important than you think. You need to make time um, for the things that you enjoy. Otherwise, you're, you're a robot. You're going to work. You're dropping off kids. You're going to football practice. You're coming home and you're doing the same thing over and over. So basically, you're existing on that on that base level, you're getting things done, but you're not enjoying your life. And, you know, you have to make time to do things that you enjoy. I play video games with my son. I make time once a week. My daughter, we try to sit down and read books, make time for it. And I know a lot of you are probably saying, I don't have time. You have to make the time or else you will not do it. So as I mentioned, NAMI St. Tammany, we're here to provide those supports, guidance, resources for anyone that's living with, an, with a mental illness or for a family member. Um, some of the things that we do, confidential phone calls. Anyone that needs help, whether it's, you know, I have recently moved to the area, I need a new psychiatrist, call us. We can kind of help walk you through it. We get calls from, hey, I have a teenage daughter that's cutting. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. They're completely confidential. You can give us as much or as little information as you like. And we're going to give you options. We're not going to tell you where to go or, you know, this is what you have to do. We're going to give you options. Um, one of the other things that I love is our mental health app. So this was originally created for our first responders. When they were, you know, responding to a mental health related call, a lot of times the family was left there with no information and they didn't know what to do next. So we started providing these packets of materials and they would leave it with the family. So once, once they left, they would have flyers and things to go through that kind of became cumbersome. Um, so we have this app, it has over 300 resources, everything from housing to employment to mental health services. And the great thing about it is you can actually text or email it completely anonymously. So it will not come from your cell phone. And it's going to provide the resource contact, what they do. Um, some of them even have what type of insurance, their hours, and everything in between. So you can have that at your fingertips and share those resources. We also have support groups for both the individual and for the family members. Those are completely free. Again, People can participate as much or as little as they like, um, but they're there to kind of help guide these individuals and fill in the gap where, you know, between services. Our signature education programs happen twice a year. So we have one for the family member, one for the individual, and then we have basics. We are seeing a lot of issues right now with you know, late teens and early 20s that are really struggling. And that basics is for parents or caregivers with teens or adolescents that are carrying some, some type of emotional behavioral health issues. You know, it's there to provide more in-depth information on how to communicate with your child, how to advocate for your child. And the great thing about our support groups and our education programs is that they're both led by individuals with lived experience. So they have either lived with some type of mental illness and are successfully managing their own recovery, or they have work through it with a loved one. So I'd mentioned mental health first aid earlier. Mental health first aid is something that um, we've been offering for a few years now. We have over 600 people trained. It's probably a little hard at this point, um, but it's just like first aid in that it teaches you how to recognize when someone is experiencing mental health symptoms, um, step in, provide resources and deescalate the situation. We have trained, you know, so many different nonprofit organizations, so many different organizations, so many teachers, um, everything in between. It is for anyone. We actually have a few coming up that um, we're very thankful that we received some grants from Chevron and Baptist Community Ministries that have allowed us to 
provide these free to the public. And again, it's a three-year certification. It helps you how to step in. Nine times out of 10, if someone is in a mental health crisis, they're more likely to come in contact with a first responder than they are just someone reaching out, lending a helping hand and saying, hey, what can I do to help you? How can I support you? So our family guide, adolescent guide, and older adult guide, we answer between 150 to 100, I don't know, 60 calls a month of people needing guidance or resources. Based on these calls, we created these different guides for individuals that are dealing with the mental health care system for the first time. And it's, you know, it goes in depth into different types of mental illnesses. It talks about involuntary commitment. It talks about different type of supports and services that you can get. And again, we have one for the family. We have one for our older adults and adolescents because all of those services are different. The last thing that I wanna cover is our NAMI St. Tammany Day Center. This was actually um, opened as part of the first phase of the Safe Haven Initiative, which Mary will be talking about here in just a minute. Um, but it is a free place where individuals living with a mental illness can come and be surrounded by individuals that are going through the same thing. Um, they create the program. They decide what, what they want to do, but it offers support groups in the morning, in the afternoon. We have transportation, snacks, and um, lunch provided every day. So not only are they getting the support that they, that they need, you know, fill in those gaps, but they're also, you know, being surrounded by individuals who are going through the same journey, and they're socializing, they're understanding, they're being part of a bigger community. So... All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mary. One second. Hi, this is Mary. I'm here. If the administrator, if you could start my video, because it will not allow me to start it myself, that would be great. Okay, can y'all see my video on the screen? Okay, thanks, Monique. Um, Once again, thank y'all so much for having me. Um, I love to come and talk about Safe Haven. It's one um, of the best parts of my job. So as Monique mentioned, um, I my name is Mary Burkell. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services on our Safe Haven campus. So first, since this is a talk about uh, mental health resources, I think it's really important to start talking about first is what is safe haven? And if I can get this to, work, there we go. So first, um, since this is about resources, let's get into the nitty gritty of what services are actually on campus. And the first, as Monique has said, um, NAMI St. Tammany is a huge partner with the safe haven campus and they provide a variety of different services. One, we, they do um, have a residential program. So it's two apartment buildings for people who are homeless and have severe mental illness, a place for them to live and to get help and support, and then they can transition back into the community. Also, the day center was one of our big first um, openings on campus, and I won't get into the details since Monique already talked about it. And there's also Nami's Closet, which is free and open to the public. It has... Um, furniture and clothes and all those things that you might need if you are in a mental health hospital or if you're transitioning back to the community. In addition on campus, Florida Parishes Human Service Authority, I'm not sure if y'all know of that organization, it serves our a five parish region, which includes St. Tammany, Tangibahoa, Washington Parish, Livingston, and St. Helena. On Safe Haven, they have two drug and alcohol um, programs the Alcohol and Drug Unit, as well as the Fountain Blue Treatment Center. Uh, one is for males and one is for females. It's basically a traditional 28-day program rehab. Um, Start Corporation is one of our newer partners out on campus, and they have two services, one being um, our Community Health Center, which is a federally qualified health center in FQHC. 
So this is an outpatient program. They provide um, primary care services as well as outpatient behavioral health. So they have counseling and they also have a nurse or practitioner that can prescribe medications. In addition, one of the things that we just opened last week that we're so excited about is our Safe Haven Crisis Center. Um, this is the second one in the state. Um, this is something very new to the behavioral health world. And really, if you're not familiar what happens when someone gets into a mental health crisis, usually they either end up in jail or the ER. Um, and neither of those places are really going to meet their needs or treat what's really going on for them. So this um, crisis receiving center is another option. So the option to come you stay a few days, uh, one to five to seven, seven at the max, and um, they're able to take the time and really give you intense resources to try to get you back into the community or refer you to the best level of care after that, that most appropriate level of care. Um, so the goal of the stay is really just to do some identification, intervention, and stabilization. Um, you know, our ERs are really for physical ailments. You know, it's about identifying what that is, treating it, and keep and keep that rolling. When really, behavioral health crisis usually takes a little bit time, more time to dig into. And unfortunately, um, there's so few beds in our state that some people end up sitting there for long periods of time waiting for treatment. So this is another alternative and option. As you can see, here's some pictures. Um, the campus, which I'll get to in a second, was was built in the 1950s, but parish government came in and did a major renovation. We think um, the environment you're in really does affect how you feel about yourself. And so we put a lot of time and effort into making it feel a certain way. Uh, we also invested in art. Um, so, so it really gives that feeling of a place of healing and a place of treatment. So those are our main uh, resources out at the Safe Haven campus. And before I get go into some community resources, I just want to give you a little brief overview about the Safe Haven campus in case you haven't heard about it. So the Safe Haven campus is the former Southeast Hospital of Louisiana campus that was built in the 1950s. It was the third state mental health hospital. Um, and really it was picked because look how beautiful this overall picture you can see of the campus. It's gorgeous out there. And it was really meant to be a place of healing. Um, so the state owned it and continued to do so until um, 2012, when then former um, Governor Bobby Jindal announced the closure. And not only was he gonna close the service, the hospital itself, but he was gonna sell the campus in open market. So that campus could have turned into um, a strip malls or um, subdivisions. And due to all the kind of mental health awareness we were having in the parish, um, it really was decided that we couldn't lose those. We couldn't lose those services, how important they were, they were to us as a community. So um, some negotiations took place between the state and parish government. By the end of 2012, we had a CEA for the parish to start taking over operations. Um, then we had to go through some legislation. And then finally in 2015, um, the parish actually officially bought um, the 263 acre property. Um, so what did, so how did we do this? How did parish government pull this off? So we did the purchase, um, I'm sorry, it was 293 acres, and we spent $15 million. Then we turned around and we sold about 100 acres to Pelican Park for a million dollars. And then we sold about 35 acres to North Lake Behavioral Health Hospital to, to, to own and run the actual inpatient services. And that was about $6.7 million. Um, so that really, we're able to get half of our purchase price back. So that would enable us financially to actually make this purchase. Um, and luckily, we've been have, we have so many great elected officials that are continuing to support this campus. Um, when the state owned it, it really um, allowed it to go into disrepair. So we have a lot of catch up work to do. So our parish president, our council, as well as our um, other partners. The great thing about this whole project is it's not just parish government, but it's other um, elected officials, 
a lot of other government agencies, nonprofit, nonprofits, and healthcare organizations have come together and really say, if we work together, we can make a difference. And I think that's so important. You know, behavioral health issues, behavioral health needs are so huge, right? It would be overwhelming for any one organization or group to really tackle. And for us to really, you know, move that needle to make a difference, we really all need to work together to be able to do that. So what does this campus look like? What is that kind of structure that we're going for? Um, so we really see mental health as kind of three basic steps. We have stabilization. So someone's in crisis and we need to stabilize them. We also have the treatment phase. So you've gotten past their crisis, but you need to actually treat whatever's going on. And then beyond treatment, you have recovering healing, which is ongoing. So we see people bring brought to the campus to safe haven from law enforcement, ambulance drop off, or even walk-ins. Um, and they would enter into the crisis receiving center. And that's what we really see as we build and as we grow, that that is gonna be the main point of entry into the behavioral health system when you're in crisis here in St. Tammany. From there, depending on uh, what you're going through, you'll either, um, will need to have some inpatient um, treatment at a, one of our local hospitals, or you're actually going to go into um, more of an outpatient treatment. So that's when you see the partial hospitalization, uh, medication management, or even the drop-in day center. Um, beyond that, really what's going to keep people together and stable is support, right? If you don't have a home, if you're living out your car, you're probably not going to be able to stay stable. If you don't have enough uh, money to pay for food and your medication, that's going to happen as well. So really giving those wraparound services to make sure people are successful long term, or at least support them so they have the best chance of success. So what do we see as outcomes? We really um, are working very hard to make this campus a healing environment. I mentioned that the state really left this campus, um, really abandoned it very uh, years ago. And um, so we're really spending a lot of time and effort to clean it up, to make it a healing environment. It's a place where people want to be and not a place where people are scared to be. Increased access. We know there's not enough behavioral health services for the need that is out there. So we wanna make sure we keep expanding that and more people have the ability to access that. So we're gonna make sure that we can serve Medicaid patients, people who are uninsured and with private insurance. Emergency room diversion. When we did this study um, several years ago, they found there was about around 2,000 unnecessary emergency room visits. And as you can imagine, to our local hospitals, that's a huge strain. So we want to help take that strain off of them and they can focus on uh, what they do best and really work together on that. Jail diversion, as you probably are aware, parish government is responsible for um, the jail costs. So it's very important for us that the people that are in jail are the only people that need to be in jail. And really we need to de decriminalize mental health. Um, so that will actually give us a savings when we're moving forward. An organizational framework. We are very fortunate right now that many of these organizations uh, work together. Um, and some of that has not been formalized, but some of this will through this process, we wanna make sure it's formal. So no matter who is in their positions, our organizations will continue this legacy and will continue to work together. Information management, as you can imagine, um, data is king and we go out and look for other funding resources and grants. We really need to be able to back up what we're doing with data. So that's gonna be an important key. And of course, if we can't pay for it, then we're not gonna be able to do it. So financial sustainability is very important for us. Um, so just to make sure you understand, the um, Safe Haven campus is owned by parish government, and then we lease out spaces to our providers, like NAMI, like Florida Parishes, like START, um, who actually provide the services. You know, we were really committed that parish government is not a healthcare organization, but we're really good at going after and getting grants, doing road and drainage and infrastructure projects. So we kind of take over and we kind of help with those projects and responsibilities, and then the service providers can really focus in on what they do best, which is providing the services. Um, I thought it was really important for me to mention, even though 
Safe Haven is what um, I help and work with. Um, I work with many of our different providers in the community. And um, if you haven't had a lot of interaction with Behavioral Health Network here, it can be very intimidating and very hard. Um, so I just wanna give everyone a, just a quick overview of some of the other services that, um, that are available that aren't on the Safe Haven campus. You know, the Safe Haven campus itself is not gonna be able to solve every single problem, but we can help fill in those gaps and help direct people and then have this bigger overall network. So first I'm gonna start with hospitalizations. Um, unfortunately, that's part of, um, part of a treatment. I shouldn't say unfortunately, it's often difficult, but, uh, but oftentimes necessary for people to get better. Um, so we don't often like to talk about the hospitalization, but it is important. Um, so we have a couple um, mental health hospitals here in, in the parish, one that is run by Beacon uh, for adults. They have kind of an adult section and then what they call a geriatric section. They have approximately 22 beds and they have two different levels, one that's more intensely critical and one that's less, and that's located out in Lacombe. We have Covington Behavioral Health, which is used to be called Greenbrier if you lived in the parish a long time. They have several different programs, including an um, adolescent inpatient, adult inpatient, and they have an adult um, intensive outpatient program. So this is once you leave the hospital, you come back several days a week just to kind of get follow-up treatment. They also opened up recently a de detoxification program. While substance abuse isn't their main um, treatment, uh, oftentimes people who are in behavioral health crisis have um, taken some drugs, so they have that to then, so they can address those issues before going into that mental health treatment. And I also like to mention they do have um, special programs for veterans and first responders that we're very fortunate to have here. Um, Lakeview Regional Medical Center, a lot of people don't know it, but they also have an adult inpatient program, but they're specifically for people who are 55 years and older and on 24 beds. And then lastly, we have North Lake Behavioral Health, which is um, adjacent right to the Safe Haven campus. They have an adolescent and adult um, treatment programs. They also have an adult intensive outpatient program and a partial hospitalization. So the partial hospitalization is more intense. You spend more time there. Um, the intensive outpatient's a little bit less. They also have a sober living program for people with substance abuse issues. You can actually live there and get support and help as they transition back. In addition to the actual hospital itself, they also have the Nest Center at North Lake, which is something they've added recently, which is their certified community behavioral health clinic. Um, they have various different services that are gonna be coming out of that, including place management, counseling services, but uh, one of the big things too is their mobile crisis team. So um, if someone's at their house and they're in crisis, they can actually get resources directly to them as well as um, you know, screenings, assessments, and diagnosis. In addition to outpatients, so we did the most intense, the um, hospitalization part, outpatient services. If you know someone who needs to get connected to outpatient services, there are several different organizations in our parish. I can't name them all, but this is some of them that we um, closely work with, which is Florida Parishes Human Service Authority. They have a clinic in Mandeville as well as Slidell. Stark Corporation, they run um, a community health clinic out of Covington as well as a safe haven campus. Um, Beacon Behavioral, um, they also have some clinics out in Slidell. And Access Health, they also have a federally qualified health center in Slidell as well as some behavioral health clinics in Mandeville and Slidell. Um, I think it's really important that when you're looking for services, you have to find something that's convenient, right? Um, you know, traveling, taking off of work, going to these types of appointments, trying to get something that is doable, I think is extremely important. And that's why we need to make sure we keep expanding our services. Because unfortunately, some of our um, citizens are going outside of our parish to receive it. And that receive services, and that puts a big strain on them. In addition, there are some other resources um, that are out there that I wanna make sure everyone's aware of. First, the Sheriff's Office, they've made a huge investment uh, with NAMI into um, behavioral health. They actually have a crisis intervention team, which is called CIT. Um, they actually go out, are specially trained to go out on behavioral health call calls, and I'm sure when we get in the question and answer part, um, Naomi can probably 
go into it a little bit more detail than I, but I also think that's important. If someone is in crisis, um, I often suggest if you have to call 911 and that's the situation you're in, make sure um, it's always helpful to identify if, if you think the person's a behavioral health crisis. Um, that can just help them to anticipate the call. And if there is CIT members in the area, um, they can hopefully send those over because of that extra training. But overall, the Sheriff's Office really committed to training all of their officers. While the CIT team um, has more training than others, um, they have all spent time um, talking about this and being able to learn special techniques to de-escalate de situations. I also want to mention the coroner's office. Not a lot of people know that um, coroners in Louisiana are charged with um, mental health. Um, so they also have a piece in this. They do uh, what they call coroner's emergency certificate. So it's when people are being um, involuntary hospitalized. So he has, a, um, Dr. Preston has a staff um, who comes out and does those and he has a really big stake and is a really great partner in this overall system. Also wanna mention Stark Corporation. They also have an assertive community treatment or ACT team. Um, this is in-home visits where they have a whole team of psychiatrists, nurses, social workers, working with someone out of their home. Because sometimes that can be difficult getting someone somewhere when they're having a hard time. I also would suggest if you're talking to someone and they need services, whether it's um, suicide intervention or opioid help, or just they just don't know where to go, I always suggest calling 211, which is via Link 211. They are our crisis line for the region and they can help get you connected, either refer you to somewhere or if you're in crisis in that moment, kind of help that person talk through it. I would also very much suggest, since this is a chamber presentation, to know your insurance resources. Um, I know here at Parish Government, part of our health insurance is that we have a call center that we can call to 24 hours a day, kind of talk about issues or stresses, and they can help us work through it. So we don't even need to go into an office to be able to do that. So know your plan, know if um, behavioral health care is covered as part of that, and then if there's any additional resources you can direct someone to. And so future services. So this is what we have in the parish now, but definitely um, many of us are working to expand those services. So I'm just gonna give you a really brief overview of some things to come. One is that parish government, we had an opioid grant. Uh, we were able to distribute some Narcan to the community to help people who are um, possibly overdosing from opioids. In um, addition to that, we're working on um, we're advertising right now for um, a company to come in to help us with software because you don't know the problem unless you know how how what those statistics are. And uh, we've gotten a lot of help from our fire districts kind of helping us because often they're first responders out there letting us know, but we need a way to get all this data from first responders together in one system so we can identify those problems and um, really brainstorm and plan for the best treatment to address them. Um, on the Safe Haven campus specifically, uh, we're working on the Cardinal Pope area that was originally built in the 60s. That was a residential program. We're working to make this um, veterans housing. So working with our other healthcare providers um, for veterans, but also supporting our veterans court um, at the 22nd Judicial District. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to expand that beyond the six buildings that we have currently. Also, um, Family Promise, they are a nonprofit organization that works with homeless families. They're kind of, they're building their day center on the Safe Haven campus. So we'll be able to help them and support them with other resources. Uh, NAMI, we're kind of bringing all their services into one area on campus that will um, include a community garden. Um, we're building a training and education center with uh, NAMI's administrative offices, as well as a 50-person conference room where people can come to campus. I think it's important for people to come to the Safe Haven campus and see what it's about before um, they are in crisis or before they need services. It really helps educate the community about what we're about. We also have other spaces on campus that are empty that we will be slowly working through and renovating and um, giving other service providers on campus. So what do we envision? We envision eventually having a family resource center and supervised visitation center to help prevent some of that childhood trauma 
a sobering center, um, more residential programs, vocational training, and the list goes on and on. There's so many needs out there um, that this is going to be just something that we're going to continue to work on to make strides step by step. There are going to be some campus improvements that are in the works, including a $5 million grant from the state that's going to help with some infrastructure needs. Uh, we're looking at some road needs. We're also partnering with LSU just to get some help from them um, to get ideas about how to plan it and how it's all going to make sense and how to make it the most healing wellness environment that we actually can. We also have um, a chapel on campus that the Archdiocese owns. Uh, we own the land, they own the actual building that we're looking to expand and doing some other um, spiritual services. You know, we're trying to treat the whole person, not just their behavioral health, not just their physical health, but also their spiritual health if they're interested in that. So that's a, kind of an, a quick overall of our Safe Haven campus and some um, suggested resources. I would say, um, you know, there are resources out there. And sometimes, as Monique said, it's very challenging to get on that right path or that right road. And really, I would suggest that people just need that extra help, that extra encouragement to continue to go down that road and to find the services. And just because one service doesn't work doesn't mean any services work, especially, you know, when you're talking about counseling, you might have to meet a couple of different counselors until you really find the one that's right for you that you can really build that trust relationship with. So I would really encourage you that if you have someone that you're supporting, that you're talking through, and they have one bad experience, just to remind them that doesn't mean everyone and every experience is going to be like that with behavioral health, that they really need to find um, you know, their, their part and their person that can really, that they can trust, that understands them, to get them the help they need moving forward. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, and thank you, um, Monique, as well. It looks like we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, is the CIT team a resource that you will recommend or send to help someone? I guess I can answer that. <laughs> um, definitely. I mentioned CIT in the, I think that comment came up, came up before I mentioned it. And I was happy to see that. Um, a lot of people don't know that our sheriff's office has the CIT team. It is still something, um, while it's been around for a little bit, unless you have a family member or someone's experienced, you actually know it exists. Mm -hmm. um, we are the only, I think, sheriff's office in our state um, that has this ability and has this specialized training unit. So it really is a huge resource. As you can imagine, if someone's in crisis, um, they can sometimes be paranoid. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like someone backed into a corner. That's how I visually envision it. So having a special team of officers who know how to respond and know how to talk to someone and really create relationships. Unfortunately, a lot, sometimes behavioral health is um, a cycle that people get kind of get into. And so they build relationships with family members and with people, and they build those trusting that makes that interaction a little bit easier and better. So yes, I would definitely recommend them. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure Nick might, might and Nami might wanna say more because they work more closely with them than I do, but, um, but we're, it's a very amazing resource that I'm grateful that we have. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly weigh in a little more on that. I mean, the, the downside is, is you know, the fact that we're talking about using law enforcement for mental health crises. That, that to me on, on the one side speaks negatively to the way that our healthcare system is brought up. Having said that, obviously we're blessed enough to have a sheriff who is committed to um, you know, training their individuals for this. So uh, I, I'm fortunate also enough to ride along with the CIT officers, at least on a monthly basis. So I do go with them and see um, the crises as they're happening in our community. And I will tell you this, that we, we are lucky to have the people that we have um, and they spend extra time with the families and with the clients. So if you are in need or someone is in danger and you do need to involve law enforcement, I would certainly um, if you're in the sheriff's office uh, area, then I would certainly make sure that you ask for a CIT officer. They're a great resource. Okay, thank you. 
Um, the next question I think would be a good one for you too, Nick. It says, is NAMI available for 24 seven crisis calls? So again, our particular office is just a Monday through Friday. Our national office does have a hotline, um, but for 24 seven, uh, you know, is in part, part of Mary's presentation. You've got two on one there. That's, that's for that. 24 um, seven services. And again, I'd have to let Mary answer this part because I'm, I'm not entirely sure of it, but I would imagine that some of the crisis receiving serv uh, center services should be open the majority of the time. As far as NAMI is concerned, our app is always available, but we are only staffed, um, you know, through, through working hours. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, um, if you're talking actually just about calling on the telephone, I would agree with him that 211 or NAMI's national line are the best. If you actually need to go and that person needs to see someone, yes, the Crisis Receiving Center is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the Safe Haven campus. Okay, great. I really appreciate all of you um, speaking today. I think that this is definitely a good step in ending the stigma um, against mental health and definitely a good step in giving um, some resources to people who might be overwhelmed or see this as a very daunting experience. So I um, appreciate you all. Um, as we wrap up, I wanna remind everybody that this has been recorded. And so please look to receive the, um, the presentation and the slides in your email and feel free by all means to pass this along to someone who you think might need, um, need the resources or um, just someone else who wasn't able to make the presentation. Um, the next Live Better presentation is going to be December 1st at 12 p.m. Um, we are gonna start advertising that one tomorrow and it's gonna be a holistic approach to health. So it's gonna be um, really talking about your annual well visit and your diet as we approach the holidays and the new year. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Y'all have a good day. Thanks for having us.